Hi, folks. This is George Carlin. I'm going to read my book to you. The book is called Brain Droppings. I will read it to you. You'll have to get someone else to understand it for you. For a long time, my stand-up material has drawn from three sources. The first is the English language. You know, words, phrases, sayings, and the ways we speak. The second source, as with most comedians, has been what I think of as the little world. Those things we all experience every day. Driving, food, pets, relationships, and idle thoughts. The third area is what I call the big world. War, politics, race, death, the social issues. So without actually having measured, I would say this book reflects the balance very closely. Now, the first two areas in the book will speak for themselves. But concerning the big world, let me say a few things. I'm happy to tell you there's very little in this world that I believe in. Listening to the comedians who comment on political, social, and cultural issues, I notice that most of their material reflects kind of an underlying belief that somehow things were better once. And with just a little effort, we could set them right again. They're looking for solutions and rooting for particular results. And I think that limits the tone and substance of what they say. They're talented and funny people, but they're really nothing more than cheerleaders attached to a specific wished-for outcome. I don't feel so confined. I frankly don't give a fuck how it all turns out in this country or anywhere else for that matter. I think the human game was up a long time ago when the high priests and traders took over. And now we're just playing out the string. And that is, of course, precisely what I find so amusing. The slow circling of the drain by a once promising species and the sappy, ever more desperate belief in this country that there is actually some sort of an American dream which has merely been misplaced. The decay and disintegration of this culture is astonishingly amusing if you're emotionally detached from it. And I've always viewed it from a safe distance, knowing I don't belong. Doesn't include me, it never has. No matter how you care to define it, I do not identify with the local group. Planet, species, race, nation, state, religion, party, union, club, association, neighborhood improvement committee. I have no interest in any of it. I love and treasure individuals as I meet them. I loathe and despise the groups they identify with and belong to. So if you hear something in this book that sounds like advocacy of a particular political point of view, please reject the notion. My interest in issues is merely to point out how badly we're doing, not to suggest a way we might do better. Don't confuse me with those who cling to hope. I enjoy describing how things are. I have no interest in how they ought to be. And I certainly have no interest in fixing them. I sincerely believe that if you think there's a solution... You're part of the problem. My motto, fuck hope. P.S. In case you're wondering, personally, I'm a joyful individual. I had a long, happy marriage and a close and loving family. My career has turned out better than I ever dreamed, and it continues to expand. I'm a personal optimist, but a skeptic about all else. What may sound to some like anger is really nothing more than sympathetic contempt. I view my species with a combination of wonder and pity, and I root for its destruction. And please don't confuse my point of view with cynicism. The real cynics are the ones who tell you everything's going to be all right. And P.P.S., by the way, if by some chance you folks do manage to straighten things out and make everything better, I still don't wish to be included. Did you ever think about this? Did you ever think about how much information in the form of radio energy there is flying through the air all around us, all over the world, right now and all the time? AM, FM, UHF, VHF, shortwave, television, CB, walkie-talkie, cell phones, cordless phones, telephone satellites, microwave relays, faxes, pagers, taxi calls, police, sheriff, hospitals, fire departments, telemetry, navigation, radar, the military, government, financial, legal, medical, the media, etc., etc., etc. Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions 
of separate little bits of electronic information flying all around the world through the air at all times. Think of that. Think of how busy the air is. Men realize this. A hundred years ago, there was none. None. Silence. Here are seven things I'm tired of. I'm getting tired of guys who smoke pipes. When are they going to outlaw this shit? Guy with a fucking pipe. It's an arrogant thing to place a burning barrier between you and the rest of the world. It's supposed to imply thoughtfulness or intelligence. It's not intelligent to stand around with a controlled fire sticking out of your mouth. I say, hey, professor, you want something hot to suck on? Call me. I'll give you something to put in your mouth. I think these pipe smokers ought to just move to the next level and go ahead and suck a dick. Nothing wrong with sucking dicks. Men do it. Women do it. Can't be all bad if everybody's doing it. I say drop the pipe and go to the dick. That's my advice. I'm here to help. I'm also getting sick of car alarms. Not the screeching and beeping. That doesn't bother me. It's just the idea of a car alarm that I find offensive. Especially the ones that talk to you. Move away. Move away. Oh, really? That's when I reach for my sharpest key. And I put a deep gouge in the paint job all the way around the car. 360 degrees. I might even make two trips around if I don't have a luncheon appointment that day. And then I walk away slowly, unconcerned about the screeching and beeping, because I know that no one takes car alarms seriously. Car alarms are a yuppie boomer conceit, and they're responsible for most of the carjacking that's going on. Car alarms and the club have made it harder for thieves to steal parked cars, and so instead they're stealing cars with people in them, and people are dying, and it's all because these selfish boomer degenerates can't stand to part with their personal property. Fuck boomers, and fuck their pussified car alarms. I'm also sick of having to look at bearded guys who don't know how to trim the lower edges of their beards, where they extend back toward the neck. They trim too far up toward the chin. Leaves a glaring, fleshy strip where there ought to be hair. Guys, you need to let the beard extend far enough back under your chin so it reaches the point where your neck begins. Then, from the fold or angle that forms between your jaw and neck, you shave downward. If you don't have that fold, if you have a fat, fleshy pouch under your jaw with no definition, you shouldn't be trimming your beard at all. You should let it grow long and bushy so that it covers that goofy-looking pouch. And I've just about had it with all these geeky fucks who walk around listening to Walkmans. What are these jackoffs telling us, anyway? They're too good to participate in daily life? They're sealing themselves off? Big fucking loss. And what is it they're listening to that's so compelling? I think a person has to be fairly uncomfortable with his own thoughts to have the need to block them out while simply walking around. I'd love to know how many of these obviously disturbed people become suicides. I've also grown weary reading about clouds in a book. Doesn't this piss you off? You're reading a nice story, and suddenly the writer has to stop and describe the clouds. Who cares? I'll bet you anything, I can write a decent novel with a good entertaining story and never once mention clouds. Really. Every book you read, if there's an outdoor scene, an open window, or even a door slightly ajar, the writer has to say, As Bo and Velma walked along the shore, the clouds hung ponderously on the horizon like steel-gray, loosely formed gorilla turds. I'm not interested. Skip the clouds and get to the fucking... The only story I know of where clouds were important was Noah's Ark. Here's something else. I don't appreciate being put on hold and being forced to listen to someone else's radio. I don't even listen to my own radio. Why should I have to pay money to call some company and listen to theirs? And it's always the same shit, soft rock. That sucky, non-threatening, easy-listening pussy music. Soft rock is an oxymoron. Furthermore, it's not rock. And it's not even music. It's just soft. One more item. I'm tired of being unable to buy clothing that doesn't have writing and printing all over it. Insipid sayings, pseudo-wisdom, cute slogans, team logos, designer names, brand trademarks, small business ego trips, the marketing pigs and advertising swine have turned us all into walking billboards. 
You see some asshole walking by, and he's got on a fruity Dodger hat and a Hard Rock Cafe T-shirt. Of course, you can't see the shirt if he's wearing his hot shit Chicago Bulls jacket, the one that only 50 million other loser jock sniffers own. And since this cretinous sports fan slash consumer zombie is completely for sale to anyone, he rounds out his ensemble with FedEx sneakers, value jet socks, Wall Street Journal sweatpants, a Starbucks jockstrap, and a Microsoft condom with Bill Gates' head on the end of it. No one in this country owns his personal appearance anymore. America has become a nation of obedient consumers actively participating in their own degradation. I have some questions about food terms. For instance, breadsticks. If drumsticks are for playing drums, you'd think breadsticks would be for playing bread, wouldn't you? Would you like some breadsticks? No, thank you. I don't play bread. I play drums. Perhaps I'll have a drum roll. Shelled peanuts. Well, why don't shelled peanuts have shells? If you're clothed, you have clothes. So if you're shelled, you should have shells. You'd think they'd call peanuts without shells unshelled peanuts, wouldn't you? Same thing goes for pitted prunes. And boned chicken. I ask you, where are the bones? I can't find them. In my opinion, it ought to be called deboned chicken. And that brings me to semi-boneless ham. What's going on here? Does it only have half a bone? Or does semi-boneless ham mean that some complete object that is not entirely a bone has been removed from the ham? I don't know. Waffle iron. Why on earth would you want to iron a waffle? Wouldn't that just flatten out all the little square things? No, no, no. I believe waffles should be dry cleaned. Pancakes, of course, should all... I grew up in New York City, and I lived there till I was about 30. And at that time, I decided I'd had enough of life in a dynamic, sophisticated city, so I moved to Los Angeles. Actually, I moved there because of the time difference. I was behind in my work, and I wanted to pick up the extra three hours. Technically, for the last 30 years, I've been living in my own past. I knew I didn't want to move to the Midwest. I could never live in a place where the outstanding geographic feature is the horizon. The Midwest seems like a nice place to catch up on your sleep. Another reason I could never live in the Midwest is that it gets really cold there. You've heard of exposure and hypothermia? I could never be comfortable in a place where you can die simply by going out to the mailbox. Living in an area where an open window can cause death seems foolish to me. Of course, living in the South was never an option. The main problem being... They have too much respect for authority. They're soldier sniffers and cop lovers. I don't respect that, and I could never live with it. There's also way too much religion in the South to be consistent with good mental health. Still, I love traveling down there, especially when I'm in the mood for a quick trip to the 13th century. I'm not someone who buys all that New South shit that you hear. I judge a place by the number of lynchings they've had overall. Atlanta, Atlanta even found it necessary to come up with an apologetic civic slogan. Atlanta, the city too busy to hate. I think they're trying to tell us something. There's also the communications problem. I have trouble understanding Southerners when they talk. Some of them sound like they're chewing on a dick. And I really have nothing against them individually. One by one, they can be quite charming. But when you take them as a whole, there's some really dangerous genetic material floating around down there. So by default, I live in Los Angeles, and it's kind of a goofy place, I'm sure you've heard. They have an airport named after John Wayne. That ought to explain it. It has a charming kind of superstitious innocence. But if you really want to understand life in California, forget the grief clinics and yogaholics, forget biofeedback, Feldenkrais, neuro-linguistic programming, and the Alexander Technique. Disregard spirit guides, centering groups, dream workshops, bioenergetics, pyramid energy, and primal therapy. 
Ignore centering, fasting, ralphing, grounding, channeling, rebirthing, nurturing, self-parenting, and colon cleansing, and don't even think about polarity work, inversion swings, flower essences, guided synchronicity, harmonic brainwave synergy, and psychocalisthenics. You also need pay no attention to nude volleyball, spinach therapy, white wine hot tubs, jogging on hot coals, and the people who sing Christmas carols to zoo animals. Forget all that. The only thing you have to know about California is this. They have traffic school for chocoholics. Okay? Okay? California is the only place where you might hear someone say, Jason can't come to the phone, he's taking his wind lesson. The problem most New Yorkers have with Los Angeles is that it's fragmented and lacks a vital center. The people have no common experience. Instead, they exude a kind of a bemused detachment that renders them intensely uninteresting. The West Coast experience is soft and peripheral. New York is hard and concentrated. California is a small woman saying, fuck me. New York is a large man saying, fuck you. Still, I live in California, but I'm not laid back, and I'm certainly not mellow. I associate those qualities with the comatose. The solar system wasn't formed because matter was laid back. Life didn't arise from the oceans and humans descend from the trees because DNA was mellow. It happened because of something called energy. New York has energy. And all I can say is this. If you can't handle it, stay the fuck out. Living in New York is a character builder. You must know who you are, what you're doing, where you're going, and how to get there. No bullshit tolerated. New York people are tough and resilient. All the rest of you are varying degrees of soft. Most outsiders can't handle New York, so they wind up back in Big Loins, Arkansas, bad-mouthing the city for the rest of their lives. Actually, most of the people who run New York down have never been there. And if they ever went, we would destroy them in nine minutes. People hate New York because that's where the action is, and they know it's passing them by. Most of the decisions that control people's lives are made in New York City, not in Washington, not on Pennsylvania Avenue, in New York City, Madison Avenue, and Wall Street. People can't handle that. Pisses them off. Fuck them. And I'm really glad the Yankees humiliated the Braves twice now in the World Series. I'm glad the gritty, tough, third-world, streetwise New York culture triumphed over the soft, suburban, wholesome, white, Christian, tacky mall culture of Atlanta. Overgrown small towns like Atlanta have no business in the major leagues in the first place. So, concerning L.A. versus New York... I now have lived half of my life in each of America's two most hated, feared, and envied cities. And you want to know something? There's no comparison. New York even has a better class of assholes. Even the lames in New York have a certain appealing, dangerous quality. As an example of how hopeless California is, when I first got there, a long time back, 30 years, a policeman gave me a ticket for jaywalking. You have to understand the kind of people who live in California. They're willing to stand, passive and inert, on a curb when absolutely no traffic is coming, or maybe just a little traffic that you could easily dodge. They simply stand there obediently and wait for an electric light to give them permission to proceed. I couldn't believe this cop. I laughed at him. Ticket cost me about $20 in 1966. Since that time, I figure I've jaywalked an additional thousand times without being caught. Fuck that lame-ass cop. I've managed to prorate that ticket down to about two cents a jaywalk. One thing I do find appealing in California is the emphasis on driving. I like to drive. I'm skillful at it, and I do it aggressively. And I don't mean I scream at people or flash them the finger. I simply go about my passage swiftly and silently with a certain deliberate dark efficiency. In the land of the unassertive, the aggressive man is king. Of course, in Los Angeles, everything is based on driving, even the killings. In New York, most people don't have cars. So if you want to kill a guy, you have to take the subway to his house. And sometimes on the way, the train is delayed and you get impatient. So you have to kill somebody on the subway. That's why there are so many subway murders in New York. No one has a car. Basically, if more people in New York had cars, the subways would be a lot safer. 
Ah, I hope you can tell. The apple, and it's not the big apple, by the way. The real term is apple. The apple is still number one in my heart. I'm so chauvinistic, I even root for New York to raise more money than Los Angeles on the arthritis telethon. And you know something? We usually do. California, bordering always on the Pacific and sometimes on the ridiculous. So why do I live here? Because the sun goes down a block from my house. You know, there are some things you never see. A puppet with a heart on. A butterfly with a swastika design. The Latin word for douchebag. Someone defecating in a church. A junkie with leisure time. A serial killer with a light-up bow tie. A mom-and-pop steel mill. A shot glass full of carrot juice. A bum with matching luggage. Really interesting twins. Condoms with pictures of the saints. Two homosexuals who own a bait shop. A pimp with a low profit margin. Or a Rolls Royce that's more than 50% percent pro- Whatever happened to Eddie? Where'd he go? Seems like he was just here. And where's Billy and Bobby and Jackie and John? Jimmy, Paul, Vinny, Tom and Charlie and Richie. Where did they go? And where the fuck did Cameron come from? And Jordan and Justin and Shane and Parker. Tucker, Tyler, Taylor, Carter, Flynn, Blake and Cody. Who let these people in? Brett, Brent, Blair, Cassidy. Where are all these goofy names coming from? Say what you will about the national candidates in 1996. At least they had the decency to be named Bill, Bob, Al, and Jack. The popularity of first names is perishable. They pass in and out of favor. Occasionally, newspapers will print the most popular names given to babies that year, and they're never the same as years before. You don't run into many little girls named Bertha or Edith anymore. Nor are there a lot of Netties and Effies, Opals, Hopes, or Pearls floating around in the daycare center. Ditto Ethel, Nellie, Myrtle, Agatha, and Mabel. And how many expectant parents are praying for a girl so they can name her Blanche, Clara, Agnes, or Lottie? None. You know why? Because most of these women are in nursing homes. But thanks to the trendies, the trendies, and the sheer passage of time, someday our substandard nursing homes will be filled with Ambers, Kayla's, Tiffany's, Caitlin's, Morgan's, Courtney's, Whitney's, Cheyenne's, Ashley's, Megan's, and Brittany's, and Heather's. And that's not to overlook Judy, Laurie, Susie, Debbie, Kelly, and Wendy, and any other name that can conceivably be spelled with a final I. There are even some girls whose names don't end in Y who can't resist the trend. Hi, my name is Margaret, but somehow I spell it with an I. There are women named Faith, Hope, Joy, and Prudence. Why not despair, guilt, rage, and grief? Seems only right. Tom, I'd like you to meet the girl of my dreams. Tragedy. She spells it with an I. I had an uncle who was embarrassed because he had a woman's name. We told him, don't worry, lots of men have women's names. Leslie, Marion, Chris, Dale, Lonnie. We tried to reassure him, but... Oh, old Uncle Margaret Mary. I guess he just couldn't handle it. I don't know why. Never bothered his wife, Turk. You know why hurricanes have names instead of numbers? To keep the killing personal. No one cares about a bunch of people killed by a number. Two hundred dead as number three slams ashore is not nearly as interesting a headline as Charlie kills two hundred. Death is much more satisfying and entertaining if you personalize it. Me? I'm still waiting for Hurricane Ed. Old Ed wouldn't hurt you, would he? Sounds kind of friendly. Hell no, we are not evacuating. Ed's coming. Guess the white guy. Odell, Tyrone, Tremaine and Sparky. 
Guess the black girl. Kathy, Joan, Peggy, and Vondalicia. First names can even suggest how tough you are. Who would you want on your side in a bar fight? Arnold, Seymour, Jasper, and Percy? Or Nitro, Hacksaw, Rhino, and Skull? And guys, which women would you rather run into when you're out drinking? Lillian, Priscilla, and Judith? Or Trixie, Bubbles, and Candy? The Kennedy family changed William Kennedy Smith's first name in order to influence the outcome of his rape trial. They changed it from Willie to Will, because guys named Will hardly ever go to jail, while America's prisons are chock full of Willies. Will is all American. Willie is... Well, just ask Michael Dukakis. He'll tell you about Mr. Horton. <laughs> People's names can be interesting because sometimes they carry with them a little emotional baggage that comes with the name. For instance, think of the names of the founders of the great religions. Those founders' names still today ring with an air of mystery. Christ, Moses, Buddha, Muhammad. But the Mormons, Joseph Smith, not too impressive. Come on, we're going to Utah. Who said so? Joe Smith. Well, I gotta go take a shit. Drop me a postcard, let me know how you like it out there. Well, I was raised Catholic, and I'm still waiting for a new pope to choose the name Corky. Wouldn't that be fun? His Holiness Pope Corky the Ninth. I think you'd have to skip right to nine to give him a little credibility, don't you? Somehow to me, Pope Corky the First doesn't command a great deal of authority. That's because some names are inappropriate in the wrong settings. You won't find many Skylar Vanderpools blowing into a harmonica on death row. No one in need of brain surgery is breaking down the door to see Dr. Lucky Lipschitz. And I'm sure only the most devoted aficionado would pay money to see a ballet dancer named Bruno McNulty. On the other hand, you'll know that America has relaxed its hopelessly tight asshole if we ever elect a president named Booger. We get a president named Booger, Skeeter, T-Bone... Stump or downtown President Brown, you'll know that finally this country is relaxing and might be a comfortable place to live. In ancient times, the rulers had magnificent names. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Suppose he had been a less imposing figure. Do you think they would have called him Alexander the Marginal? As it is, he had detractors, you know. People who called him Alexander the Scumbag. History has other impressive names from simpler times. Edward the Fair, Charles the Bold, Catherine the Great. These days they'd be Edward the Abuse Victim, Charles the Underachiever, and Catherine the Recovering Codependent. And let's not forget the historical figures we never hear of. Tiberius the Wanker and Lucretius the Dogfucker. Some names are embarrassing. We had a guy in my neighborhood, Michael Hunt, who called himself Mickey because the only alternative was my cunt. And, as Beretta used to say, death did Hi, welcome to the George Carlin Book Club. We've got books out the ass. Call now. Call now. Here are some of the titles you'll receive. How to remove chewing gum from your bush. How to turn your front lawn into a cat house. How to remove an infected cyst from a loved one. How to make two small hats out of a brassiere. How to make a brassiere out of two small hats. How to have really nice lymph glands. How to act laid back during a grease fire. How to spot a creep from across the street. How to dance with a Swedish person. How to induce a clergyman to grab you by the nuts. How to milk a dog while it's sleeping. How to get through college without books. How to make a small salad out of your work pants. How to lure a weasel into a cardboard box. How to fillet a panda. How to get a tan with a blowtorch. How to make an oil lamp out of your genitals. How to style your hair with a bullwhip. How to convert an old leather chair into twelve pairs of shoes. How to achieve multiple orgasms with a pair of tweezers. How to kill a rat with a paper clip. How to lease out the space inside your nose. How to spot truly vicious people in church. How to become a total fucking greaseball. Call now. Call now. 
I like to look at tattoos on people. I think they're really cool, you know? But I would never get one. I always thought it was a bad idea to let some guy draw a picture on me that'll probably never come off, you know? I'm conservative on this one. Not only the thing never comes off, but it hurts to put it on. And you got to pay the guy. Plus, if you do want to take it off, it hurts again, and you got to pay the guy again. Another reason not to get a tattoo is that a tattoo is positive identification. No one should ever do anything to help the police in any way, especially when you may be the object of their interest. So I never got a tattoo, but I had some good ideas. I was going to get dotted lines tattooed on all my joints, wherever I bend, with little instructions, fold here, do not glue. I also thought about getting a necklace of hickeys. Here's one I almost went through with. I was going to get my nipples tattooed as radio dials, volume and tuning, and the hair in the middle of my chest would be the speaker, and for stereo... I just raised my arms. Armpit speakers. I guess the most popular tattoo of all time has to be mom. A lot of guys get mom. No one ever gets pop. You know why? Because you can't read pop in the mirror. In a mirror, mom comes out mom. Pop comes out 909. What the fuck is that? If you guys want to get a mom tattoo and save a little money, here's how you do it. Just get two letters done. Saves you a little money. Get about a one-inch capital M tattooed on each cheek of your ass in pink and brown ink. Then when you bend over, it says mom. And then later, if you're having sex with your girlfriend and her parents are in the next room, don't want to make any noise, when you finish up, you can just lie on your back, draw your legs up to your chest, and silently say, wow. Here's another good tattoo idea for you guys. At the top of your inner thigh, right next to your groin, you put, in case of emergency, pull handle. Well, get your penis tattooed to resemble a candy cane. Great for Christmas blowjobs. But be very careful not to let the tattoo guy bend your penis into the J shape. Not good. Get the words tote bag tattooed on your scrotum. Or Bloomingdale's might be good. Cartier might be more appropriate, a little hairy pouch for your precious jewels. How about a tattoo of the Three Stooges peering into your asshole? Or a serpent coming out? Or a nice tattoo of Madonna with her hand up your ass? Here's a good one for right next to your asshole. No gerbils. Or gerbils welcome. Depends on what puts a smile on your face. Here would be a great tattoo for right in the middle of your forehead. I have colored ink in my skin. Or, your message here, 50 cents. How about this, right in the middle of your forehead? Yeah, it's a tattoo, you miserable prick, right in the middle of my forehead. If you don't like it, suck my dick. This will keep you from having to deal with that bothersome job market. And here's a solution to an age-old tattoo problem. If your girlfriend's name, say, Susie, is tattooed on your arm and you break up with her, don't have the tattoo removed. Just have the tattoo reworked so that it says, Fuck Susie. By the way, you don't actually have to do all these things. They're just suggestions. Think them over first. Sit down. Have six or seven vodkas. And give them a few seconds' thought. Besides, you want to know something? Tattoos are passé. They're yesterday's thing. I'm looking for the next big thing in body decoration, and I think I might have it. You know, everyone's skin has imperfections, right? It's unavoidable. Pock marks, wrinkles, bullet holes, scars, blotches, stab wounds, cysts, warts, needle holes, acne pits, and enlarged pores. I think people should see these imperfections and disfigurements as positive things. Flaws and defects can actually be forms of decoration. Take moles, God's punctuation marks. Moles are great, and they can be useful if you want a really interesting look. The only problem is they're usually randomly placed. They don't represent anything. I think plastic surgeons should offer a new service rearranging people's moles. Think of your moles as fashion accessories. God, look at all the moles that guy has. 
Yes, and aren't they nicely arranged? There are lots of things you can do with moles. Make the double helix. Do a happy Hitler face. Spell out the name of your bowling team on your back. And how about moles with Velcro so you could change your look every day? Here's something novel. Choose a good-sized mole on your arm and tattoo little legs sticking out of the sides. People will constantly be trying to shoo the bug off your arm. It's great for picking up girls. Next, body piercing. Now, the piercing movement is off to a good start, and I like the idea behind it, self-esteem through self-mutilation. I've always said, when in doubt, punch a hole in yourself. That part is fine, but I think the piercing people are missing a good bet. Vital organs. I mean, skin is one thing. That's easy. But how about getting your lungs or your kidneys pierced? Why not some lovely diamond studs all over the surface of your liver? Or a couple of nice 18-carat gold rings hanging from your thyroid gland? But, you know, stuff like this might not be dangerous enough for today's happening people. What's really going to be great is when the ozone layer is completely gone and everyone has melanomas. Then you'll start to see fashion skin cancer. Bet you it happens. Probably start in Malibu. People will use their skin cancers to form little designs. Since it's Malibu, a lot of them will do their zodiac sign. Of course, if your sign is cancer, you're really in good shape. I believe skin cancer will eventually become part of every American's fashion arsenal. That's a lovely growth, Bambi. Twenty millimeters and right between your eyes. God, I'm so jealous. Before I leave this subject, I have two more ideas for the truly avant-garde. How about living, small, live mammals medically grafted onto your skin? Huh? Wouldn't you like to have a prairie dog living in the middle of your chest, sharing your blood supply? How about an adult male Norwegian rat sewn onto the top of your head, keeping an eye on everything? I think we also might want to take a page from Africa's book and get into deliberate scarring. Not ritual scars that form coherent designs, random scarring. Let a bunch of drunks with swords inflict hundreds of small deep cuts on your skin. Or have a friend throw boiling grease all over you, and then sit back and see what develops. I don't believe the body decorating trend has reached its peak yet, and as it does, I shall try to be at the forefront, always continuing to point America toward the hot new look. One morning recently, there was something I couldn't remember. Uh, I sort of knew what it was related to, but uh, I couldn't quite bring it to mind. Seemed like the letter M was involved. And then suddenly it came to me. I remembered it. That was in, in the morning. Then later that afternoon, even though I was able to recall my experience that morning of not being able to remember something, I could no longer remember what the thing was, what it was related to, or what letter of the alphabet had been involved. And what's strange to me is that that morning, the first time I couldn't remember it, the thing did eventually come back to me. But later that afternoon, in spite of this earlier success, I drew a complete blank. I still don't know what it was. And the nice thing is that a month from now, I'll have no memory of the incident whatsoever. Unless, of course... As you're listening to this, I'll bet you have your stuff with you, or nearby. I'll bet anything. In your pockets. Guys have stuff in their pockets. Women have stuff in their purses. Or some women have pockets, and some guys have purses. That's okay. So all different ways of carrying your stuff. Then there's all the stuff you have in your car. You got stuff in the trunk. A lot of different stuff. Spare tire, jack, tools, old blanket, extra pair of sneakers just in case you wind up barefoot on the highway some night. And you've got other stuff in your car, in the glove box, stuff you might need in a hurry, flashlight, map, sunglasses, automatic weapon. You know, just in case you wind up barefoot on the highway some night. 
So stuff is important. You gotta take care of your stuff. You gotta have a place for your stuff. Everybody's gotta have a place for their stuff. That's what life is all about. Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. A place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You can see that when you're taken off in an airplane. You look down, you see all the little piles of stuff. Everybody's got his own little pile of stuff. And they lock it up. That's right. When you leave your house, you got to lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. Because they always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers, National Geographic's commemorative plates, your prize collection of Navajo underwear. They're not interested. They just want the good stuff, the shiny stuff, the electronic stuff. So when you get right down to it, your house is nothing more than a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Because that's what this country's all about. Trying to get more stuff. Stuff you don't want. Stuff you don't need. Stuff that's poorly made. Stuff that's overpriced. Even stuff you can't afford. Got to keep on getting more stuff. Otherwise, someone else might wind up with more stuff. Can't let that happen. Got to have the most stuff. So you keep getting more and more stuff and putting it in different places. In the closets, in the attic, in the basement, in the garage. And there might even be some stuff you left at your parents' house. Baseball cards, comic books, photographs, souvenirs. Actually, your parents threw that stuff out a long time ago. But now you got a house full of stuff. And even though you might like your house, you got to move. Got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. And that means you got to move all your stuff. Or maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Storage. Imagine that. There's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on other people's stuff. Or maybe you could sell some of your stuff, have a yard sale, have a garage sale. Some people drive around all weekend just looking for garage sales. They don't have enough of their own stuff. They want to buy other people's stuff. Or you could take your stuff to the swap meet, the flea market, the rummage sale, or the auction. A lot of ways to get rid of your stuff. You can even give your stuff away. Salvation Army and Goodwill will actually come to your house and pick up your stuff and give it to people who don't have much stuff. It's part of what the economists call the redistribution of stuff. Okay, enough about your stuff. Let's talk about other people's stuff. Do you ever notice when you visit someone else's house, you never quite feel at home? You know why? No room for your stuff. Somebody else's stuff is all over the place. And what crummy stuff it is. God, where did they get this stuff? And you know how sometimes when you're visiting someone, you unexpectedly have to stay overnight, gets real late, you know, and you decide to stay over. So they put you in a bedroom they don't use too often because Grandma died in it 11 years ago and they haven't moved any of her stuff, not even the vaporizer. Or whatever room they put you in. There's usually a dresser or a nightstand. And there's never any room on it for your stuff. Someone else's shit is on the dresser. Have you noticed that their stuff is shit and your shit is stuff? Get this shit off of here so I can put my stuff down. Crap is also a form of stuff. Crap is the stuff that belongs to the person you just broke up with. When are you coming over here to pick up the rest of your crap? Now let's talk about traveling. Sometimes you go on vacation. You got to take some of your stuff. Mostly stuff to wear. But which stuff should you take? Can't take all your stuff. Just the stuff you really like. The stuff that fits you well that month. In effect, on vacation, you take a smaller, second version of your stuff. Let's say you go to Honolulu for two weeks. You got to take two big suitcases of stuff. Two weeks, two big suitcases. That's the stuff you check onto the plane. But you also got your carry-on stuff. Plus the stuff you bought in the airport. So now you're all set to go. You got stuff in the overhead rack, stuff under the seat, stuff in the seat pocket, and stuff in your lap. And let's not forget the stuff you're going to steal from the airline. Silverware, soap, blanket, toilet paper, salt, and pepper shakers. Too bad those headsets won't work at home. 
And so you fly to Honolulu and claim your stuff if the airline didn't drop it in the ocean. And you go to the hotel, and the first thing you do is put away your stuff. There's lots of places in a hotel to put your stuff. I'll put some stuff in here, you put some stuff in there. Hey, hey don't put your stuff in there, that's my stuff. Here, hey, here's another place, put some stuff in here, and there's another place. Hey, put, hey, hey, you know what? We got more places than we got stuff. We're going to have to go out and buy more stuff. Finally, you put away all your stuff, but you don't quite feel at ease because you're a long way from home. Still, you sense that you must be okay because you do have some of your stuff with you. And so, you relax in Honolulu on that basis. That's when your friend from Maui calls and says, Hey, why don't you come over to Maui for the weekend? Spend a couple of nights over here. Oh, no. Now what do you bring? Can't bring all this stuff. You got to bring an even smaller version of your stuff. Just enough stuff for a weekend on Maui. The third version of your stuff. And as you're flying over to Maui, you realize that you're really spread out now. You got stuff all over the world. Stuff at home. Stuff in the garage. Stuff at your parents' house. Maybe. Stuff in storage. Stuff in Honolulu. And stuff on the plane. Supply lines are getting longer and harder to maintain. Finally, you get to your friend's place on Maui, and they give you a little room to sleep in, and there's a nightstand. Not much room on it for your stuff, but it's okay, because you don't have much stuff now. You got your 8x10 autograph picture of Drew Carey, large can of Gorgonzola-flavored cheese Whiz, a small unopened packet of brown confetti, a relief map of Corsica, and a family-sized jar of peppermint-flavored petrified egg whites. And you know that even though you're a long way from home, you must be okay because you do have a good supply of peppermint-flavored petrified egg whites. And so you begin to relax in Maui on that basis. That's when your friend says, Hey, I think tonight we'll go over the other side of the island to visit my sister. Maybe spend the night over there. Oh, no. Now what do you bring? Right you got to bring an even smaller version, the fourth version of your stuff, just the stuff you know you're going to need. Money, keys, comb, wallet, lighter, hanky, pen, cigarettes, contraceptives, Vaseline, whips, chains, whistles, dildos, and a book. Just the stuff you hope you're going to need. Actually, your friend's sister probably has her own dildos. And by the way, if you go to the beach while you're visiting the sister, you're going to have to bring... Uh, that's right... An even smaller version of your stuff. The fifth version. Cigarettes and wallet. That's it. You can always borrow someone's suntan lotion. And then suppose while you're there on the beach, you decide to walk over to the refreshment stand to get a hot dog. That's right, my friend. Number six. The most important version of your stuff. Your wallet. Your wallet contains the only stuff you really can't do without. Well, by the time you get home from Hawaii, you're probably fed up with all your stuff and all the problems it creates. And, and so about a week later, you clean out the closet, the attic, the basement, the garage, the storage locker, and all the other places you keep your stuff. And you get things down to manageable proportions. Just the right amount of stuff to lead a simple and uncomplicated life. And that's when the phone rings. It's a lawyer. Seems your aunt has died and left you all her stuff. Oh, no. Now what do you do? Right. You do the only thing you can do. The honorable thing. You tell the lawyer to... These are some of the things I think about when I'm sitting home alone and the power goes out. If something in the future is canceled, what is canceled? What has really happened? Something that didn't occur yet is now never going to occur at all. Does that qualify as an event? Here's something. Think about a place you've never seen, but for many years you've pictured it in your mind, and then you finally see it. After you leave, do you continue to picture it the old way? Imagine a place called Moravia, 
a non-existent country. See it in your mind. See a few details. Okay, now Moravia ceases to exist. Is your picture of the original non-existent country different from what it looks like now that it ceases to exist? They're both non-existent. Okay, picture Moravia again, the original way. Now Moravia is invaded by a neighboring country, Boronia. Picture Boronia. It's completely different from Moravia. Different geography, different ethnic stock, beliefs, way of life, government, everything. See it? Okay, Boronia invades Moravia and occupies it and begins to make some changes. Now picture Moravia again. Does it look different? Isn't that weird? Looks a little like Boronia, doesn't it? Here's another one. Maybe you've done this. You've never been to your friend's place of work, but you've pictured it because he's talked about it. Then he changes jobs, but it's a similar job. Do you bother to change your mental picture of where he works? And how much do you change it? Or you have a friend who works at one Wendy's and gets transferred to a different Wendy's. Do you picture a whole new Wendy's? Or do you get lazy and say, well, they're all pretty much the same, so I'll just go with the old Wendy's? Here's something I think about. If a radio station changes its call letters, moves its studio across town, hires all new disc jockeys, and changes the style of music it plays, but keeps the same frequency on the dial, is it still the same radio station? Suppose they only change the music. Hmm. Here's something I like to think about. On a given day, Flight 23 goes from New York to Los Angeles. The following month, Flight 23 goes from New York to Los Angeles again. But the crew is different, the passengers are different, and it's a completely different airplane. How can both flights be Flight 23? They can't. A week is not based on anything in nature, as are days or months or years. So birds, they don't understand weeks or weekdays. They do know enough to come back to the sidewalk cafe every day for crumbs. But suppose the cafe is in the business district and it's closed on the weekends. What do the birds think of that? I'll bet they're really glad when Monday rolls around, unlike the rest of us. These are some of the thoughts that kept me out of the really... You know what we need? New zodiac signs. The old ones, I don't know, they depict an obsolete world. The archer, the water bearer, and talk about obsolete, the virgin. What we need are modern zodiac signs that represent today's reality. The serial rapist, the lone gunman, the suicide bomber, the paranoid schizophrenic, the transsexual crackhead, the money launderer, the disgruntled postal worker, the diseased homeless veteran, the South American drug lord, the third generation welfare recipient, the human immunodeficiency virus, and the personal trainer. And in case you're one of those people who doesn't relate well to the real world, here's a nice safe zodiac for you. The soccer mom, the sensitive male, the special needs child, the role model, the overachiever, the jogger, the little leaguer, the recycler, the anchor person, the codependent, the Domino's delivery boy, and the recovering shop. Item. A man is seated in a football stadium with a small TV set tuned to the game. The sideline camera takes his picture and his image travels through the lens, out of the camera, to the truck, to the satellite, to a ground station several miles away, back into the air, and then to the man's TV set. He sees himself on the screen.
The image travels from his eyes to his brain. His brain sends a signal to his arm to start waving. The image travels to the camera, through the lens, to the truck, to the satellite, to another ground station a thousand miles away, where it is retransmitted into the air and picked up by a cable company that sends it to the man's parents' TV set. The image travels from the screen. To his mother's eyes, along the optic nerve, to her brain, where it references her memory and recognition takes place. Her brain then sends a series of signals to her lungs, throat, lips, and tongue, and she says, "Look, it." Hey. Baseball is different. From any other sport, and I mean really different. Just for starters, in an odd way, baseball is the only sport you cannot watch in a mirror sensibly. All the other sports are symmetrical: basketball, football, hockey. You can watch them in the mirror. The numbers are backwards, but the games make sense. Baseball, not symmetrical. Guy hits the ball, he runs to third base. It's counterintuitive. It spoils the game, and a home run trot is really interesting. Guy hits the ball, trots slowly around the bases in the wrong direction, and nobody gives a shit. Everybody cheers. But let's get more basic. Baseball is different from other sports in a number of other ways. First of all, in most sports, you score points or goals. Baseball, you score runs. In most sports, the ball or object is put in play by the offensive team. In baseball, the defense puts the ball in play, and only the defense is allowed to touch the ball. In fact, in baseball, if an offensive player touches the ball intentionally, he's out. Sometimes unintentionally, he's out. In most sports played with a ball, you score with the ball, and without the ball, you cannot score. In baseball, you score without the ball, and only the ball can prevent you from scoring. In most sports, the team is run by a coach. In baseball, the team is run by a manager, and only in baseball does the manager or coach wear the same clothing the players do. If you'd ever seen John Madden in his Oakland Raiders football uniform, you would know the reason for this custom. Now I've mentioned football as well. Baseball and football are the two most popular spectator team sports in this country, and as such, wouldn't you think that maybe they might tell us a little about ourselves, about our qualities, our values, and perhaps how we have changed over the last hundred and fifty years? For those reasons, I enjoy comparing. Baseball and football. Baseball is a 19th-century pastoral game. Football is a 20th-century technological struggle. Baseball is played on a diamond in a park, the baseball park. Football is played on a gridiron in a stadium, sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. Baseball begins in the spring, the season of new life. Football begins in the fall when everything is dying. In football, you wear a helmet. In baseball, you wear a cap. Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? How many downs do we have left? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? Are you up? I'm not up. He's up. In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball. You make an error. Whoops! In football, the specialist comes in to kick something. In baseball, the specialist comes in to relieve somebody. Football has hitting, clipping, spearing, piling on, personal fouls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has the sacrifice. Football is played in any kind of weather: rain, snow, sleet, hail, fog. Can't see the game. Don't know if there is a game going on. Mud on the field. Can't read the uniforms. Can't read the yard markers. The struggle will continue. In baseball, if it rains, we don't go out to play. I can't go out. It's raining out. Baseball has the seventh inning stretch. Football has the two-minute warning. Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's going to end. We might have extra innings. 
Football is rigidly timed, and it will end even if we have to go to sudden death. In baseball, during the game, in the stands, there's kind of a picnic feeling. Emotions may run high or low, but there's not that much unpleasantness. In football, during the game, in the stands, you can be sure that at least twenty-seven times you are perfectly capable of taking the life of a fellow human being, preferably a stranger. And finally, the objectives of the two games are completely different. In football, the object is for the quarterback. Otherwise known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home and to be safe. I hope I'll be safe at home. I don't give a hoot. Not since 1959. That was the last one I gave. Well, I, well, I might have given a hoot in 1967, just one, as a favor to a friend. But that was it. I'm not sure I even have any left. Frankly, I'd be afraid to look. I think I'm all out of hoots. If you want one, you're going to have to find it on your own. Maybe you could rent a hoot or steal one. I'll bet by now there's a black market in hoots, hot hoots. By the way, in addition to those who don't give a hoot, there are many others who will not take a hoot. Too proud. These are the same people who will not take any guff. Athletes like that physical shit, you know. When they're pleased with each other, they bump chests and butt heads and bang forearms. Why don't they just punch each other in the fucking teeth? Wouldn't that be great? Teammates, I mean. After a touchdown pass, why doesn't the guy who caught the ball just go over and kick the quarterback right in the nuts? Same with the slam dunk in basketball. The guy who scores ought to grab a chair and beat the living shit out of the guy who fed him the ball for about forty-five minutes. If this type of celebration were more common, the post-game show from the winners' locker room would be a lot livelier. And I also think there should be at least one sport where the object is to kill someone—a team sport, death ball. Let's face it: athletes are mostly physical freaks with serious personality defects where competition is concerned, and they just love someone to motivate them. Well, what greater motivation can there be than trying to avoid being killed? It's a fucking natural. And for me. What could be more fun than watching one of these jackoffs motivate his ugly ass into an early grave every game? Here's another thing I love: losing streaks. I wish some year a baseball team would lose 162 games. I especially like decades-long postseason losing streaks. In fact, as soon as my teams are out of the running, I start actively rooting for the Cubs. Red Sox, Bills, and Vikings to get as far as they can in the postseason, so that ultimately they can let the big prize slip away one more time. I think it is infinitely more interesting a news story for a team to repeatedly fail at the highest level than it is for them to finally win. If the Cubs ever win a World Series, the news coverage will be the most boring bunch of shit you can. Some people don't like puns, you know, or wordplay. I do. Anticlimax. That's what my uncle was good at. The game of chess. The peace movement. Seersucker. A person who blows clairvoyance. Passing gear. Clothing worn by light-skinned blacks who wish to be thought of as white. Outspoken when you lose a debate. Hormone. The sound a prostitute makes, so you'll think you're a real good fuck. Drug traffic, driving to your connection's house. Sex drive, similar to drug traffic, but with a different destination. Douche, a female duke. Octopus, an eight-sided vagina. Trampoline, a sexual lubricant popular with sluts. Parakeet. A keat that takes care of you until the real keat arrives.
Pussyfoot, a rare female birth defect requiring the use of open-toed shoes. Beer nuts, the official disease of Milwaukee. Cotton balls, the final stage of beer nuts. Cow hand, an occupational disability common among dairy farmers. Woodpecker, a 17th century prosthetic device. Leatherette, a short sadomasochist. Cap pistol, a small gun that can be hidden in your hat. A gay barbarian, Attila the Hun. The reason for most violence against gays is that heterosexual men are forced to prove that they themselves are not gay. It goes like this. Men in strong male subcultures like the police, the military, and sports, and a few other cesspools, they bond very strongly. Hunting, and fishing, and golfing friendships also produce this unnatural bonding. These guys bond and bond and bond, and they get closer and closer until finally they're just drunk enough to say, You know, I really love these guys. And that frightens them. So they quickly add, But I'm not a queer. See the dilemma? Now they have to go out of their way to prove to the world, to their buddies, and to themselves that they don't harbor homoerotic feelings. And it's only a short step from, I'm not a queer, to, in fact, I hate queers. And another short step to, let's go kill some queers. And what they really seek to kill is not the queer outside, it's the queer inside they fear. Gay bashers are repressed homosexuals attempting to deny the queer inside. But certain signals get past the screen. That's why you see so many policemen with those precious little well-groomed mustaches. You'd see more of the same mustaches on athletes and military men, but those two groups are not allowed to express themselves freely. Military drones and many sheep-like athletes have dress codes and are forbidden to wear facial hair. The idea is to limit and reduce their individuality. These are men who have chosen to allow the organization to run their lives. That's why athletes, police, and military men have that rigid, unbending body language. They're severely repressed. Guess what they're repressing? Why do you think they call those police cars crew? People used to take drugs, now they do drugs. Some people don't do drugs, they do lunch. And sometimes instead of taking drugs, they take meetings. They used to have meetings. Now instead of having meetings, they have relationships. Some people who don't do drugs but have a relationship will take a meeting while they do lunch. People used to get sex, now they have sex. So far they don't do sex, although they do say, let's do it. If the sex is overly aggressive, we say the person was taken. I guess if one's not giving, the other's going to take. We take a lot of things. We take a lot of good things. We take time. We take heart. We take solace, medicine, advice. We take a job, take a break, take a vacation, a leave, a nap, a rest, a seat. We take a meal. We take, take, take until we can't take any more. Maybe it's because our inner nature is not primarily one of giving, but of taking. Even these things we take that should balance our lives and give us rest do not. We make work out of them. We do them aggressively, always in control. Take. But when we give, we give a lot of bad things. We give trouble, heartache, sorrow. We give someone a hard time, a migraine, give them a heart attack, and give them a big pain in the ass. So I say give up, get fucked, take a hike, and have... What's all this stuff about motivation? I say if you need motivation, you probably need more than motivation. You probably need chemical intervention or brain surgery. Actually, if you ask me, this country could do with a little less motivation. The people who are causing all the trouble seem highly motivated to me. Serial killers, stock swindlers, drug dealers, Christian Republicans... I'm not sure motivation is always a good thing. You show me a lazy prick who's lying in bed all day watching TV and only occasionally getting up to piss, and I'll show you a guy who's not causing...
You know what America lacks? A present. America has no now. We're reluctant to acknowledge the present. I guess it's too embarrassing. Instead, we reach into the past. Our culture is composed of sequels, reruns, remakes, revivals, reissues, re-releases, recreations, reenactments, adaptations, anniversaries, memorabilia, oldies radio, and nostalgia record collections. World War II has been refought on television so many times the Germans and Japanese are now drawing residuals. Of course, being essentially full of shit, we sometimes feel the need to dress up this past preoccupation, as with pathetic references to reruns as encore presentations. Even instant replay is a form of token nostalgia, a brief visit to the immediate past for re-examination. Before slapping it onto a highlight video for further review and re-review on into the indefinite future, this yester mania of ours includes fantasy baseball camps where aging sad sacks pay money to catch baseballs thrown by men who were once their heroes. It's part of the fascination with sports memorabilia, a memory industry, and it's so lucrative it has attracted counterfeiters. In this case, the age of hyphens, we are truly. Retro Americans, and our television newscasts not only reflect this condition; they feed it. Everything they report is twisted into some reference to the past. If there's going to be a summit meeting, you'll be told all about the last six summit meetings. If there's a big earthquake, they'll do a story about big earthquakes of the past. If there's a mine disaster, you'll hear about every mine disaster since the inception of mining. They're obsessed with looking back. I swear. I actually heard this next thing during a newscast as the anchorman went to a commercial break. He said, "Still ahead, a look back." Honest, he said it. Hurricane Hugo, one year later. Why? The anniversary of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. For what reason? The anniversary of the Bay of Pigs, Pan Am Flight 103, the hostages in Iran, the fall of the Berlin Wall, VJ Day, VE Day, Vietnam. Who gives a fuck? Bugs Bunny's fiftieth birthday, Lassie's fifty-fifth, the Golden Jubilee of Gone with the Wind, the start of the Korean War. Barbie celebrates her thirty-fifth, the twenty-fifth anniversary of the New York blackout. Bambi turns fifty. Shit, I didn't even like Bambi when I was supposed to. How much do I care now? There's really no harm, I guess, in reviewing the past from time to time. Knowing where you've been is part of knowing where you are, and all that happy horse shit. But the American media have an absolute fixation on this. They rob us of the present by insisting on the past. If they were able, I'm sure they would pay equal attention to the future. Trouble is, they don't have any film on it. And so, on television news, there is oddly very little emphasis on the present, on today's actual news. The present exists only in 30-second stories built around eight-second sound bites. Remember, sound bite is their phrase. That's what they give you. Just a bite. No chewing. No digestion, no nourishment, malnutrition. Another way they avoid the present moment is to look ahead on their own schedules. The television news industry seems to revolve around what's coming next. Still to come, just ahead, up next, coming up this half hour, more to come. Stay with us. Still ahead, also later. They even preview what's going to happen as little as one hour later. During the five o'clock news, the empty-headed prick who does the five o'clock news will suddenly say, "Here's a look at what's coming up on the six o'clock news." Then the empty-headed prick who does the six o'clock news will appear in shirt sleeves in the newsroom to create the illusion of actual work, and tell you about several stories that the empty-headed prick who does the five o'clock news should already have told you about if he were really a newsman. And so it goes around the clock. On the five o'clock news, they tell you about the six o'clock news. At six o'clock, they tell you about eleven. At eleven, they plug the morning news. The morning man promos the noontime lady, and sure enough, a little later afternoon, here comes that empty-headed prick from the five o'clock news to tell you what he's going to do on the five o'clock news. You know, if a guy were paranoid, he might not be blamed for thinking that the people who run things don't want you dwelling too much on the present. Because keep in mind, the news media are not independent. They're a sort of bulletin board and public relations firm for the ruling class, the people who run things. Those who decide what news you will or will not hear are paid by and tolerated purely at the whim of those who hold economic power. 
If the parent corporation doesn't want you to know something, it won't be on the news. Period. Or at the very least, it will be slanted to suit them and then barely followed up. Enjoy your snooze, folks.